Uh, and we're going to talk today about uh, the persistence of AV vectors in vivo and um, clinical product release, which, given the background that I gave this morning, should maybe uh, make some, some sense. So uh, most of the people here in the audience, I think, know the story of AV. It's based on a non-pathogenic human virus. It's a single strand of DNA. Uh, the particles are small stable and amenable to purification and storage. So if you think of about a product, a classic biopharmaceutical product, you need to purify these things and, and store them in a way that they can get to uh, the bedside uh, in a potent form. There are no viral genes, so it's less immunogenic, let's say, than, than an adenoviral vector. It transduces non-dividing cells and it's able to be maintained. Really, for the lifetime of animals, these animals are dying of old age before gene expression uh, runs out. The two caveats are, are the capacity for the transgene cassette is limited to about, uh, about four and a half KB. That includes the promoter, poly A, and the other control elements. And classically, they've been difficult to produce and purify, but that's, that is getting better, okay? Rob Cotton at the NIH has developed a baculoviral system that is extremely uh, productive. I think out of 100 liters, he's getting in the neighborhood of mid 10 to the 15th vector genomes. So really, now you're starting to talk about a scale that can support phase three and commercialization. So the first part of my talk is about how vectors persist in muscle as epigenetic, as episomal chromatin, okay? So this is data uh, on the left from uh, Rivera and Wilson showing that an, an AV2 vector driven by CMV expressing the erythropoietin gene in non-human primates um, last, the expression is out over almost seven years. Uh, here, this is hematocrit. This is the EPO uh, protein levels measured in the serum. Here, we're looking at animals out of Philippe Moulier's lab out to five years. This is a TET-regulated EPO where doxycycline is administered at the arrows and then EPO expression is measured um, at the times of induction. So it tells you that the, the AAV vector genome persists in this tissue for years in non-human primates, and that the expression is maintained <coughs> for the same duration. So this is all active uh, active genomes. They're not being suppressed by methylation or other epigenetic modifications. So here in this time course, you see, you know, whether this is factor nine or EPO or some other uh, transgene product, we always see this high level of expression that comes back down to some stable level and then persists. So what's happening here at stage one, to the best of our knowledge, is we're converting single strand, this single strand AAV genome to a double strand. That's now a template for transcription. Then this gets concatamerized and circularized, either as circular monomers or circular concatamers. And the thinking was that there's some integration, and that may be actually tissue-specific. Then here at stage two, we don't know whether this expression is going down because there's a partial immune response, loss of AAV vectors, or uh, some silencing that's happening. And then here at three, we have stable gene expression 
And the question is, how does this persist? Okay. So the objective of the studies was to determine if there was a correlation between the structure of the genome and long-term expression uh, in non-human primates. And we use this vector. It's the LEAY uh, transgene, which is a, a variant of CTLA-4. IG um, under the control of an RSV promoter, and it has a WPRE element. Four animals were injected, two of them with AAV1 and two of them with AAV8 at uh, these doses, so about the same dose per kilogram uh, for the four animals. Okay. This is the gene expression of CTLA-4. You can see there's, it overshoots and then it comes back to this baseline. And then at this point we are resecting the entire muscle out of the animal. And then when we do analysis, the copy numbers are higher for AAV1 than AAV8. Uh, we're getting about 30 copies with AV1 uh, versus around 8 copies for AV8. Okay, so we take that muscle and we treat it two different ways. One is a total DNA isolation where we digest the, the muscle proteins with proteinase K and urea, do phenol chloroform, extract the total DNA, and then analyze that for the, the copy numbers, for the molecular structure, and to determine whether it's episomal or integrated. Okay. The muscle is also processed by homogenization and then permeabilization of the cells with uh, detergent, nuclei isolation, and then some quality control to show that we've isolated the nuclei. And then those nuclei are digested with micrococcal nuclease. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, so for this analysis, we are digesting the genomes with a variety of restriction enzymes that tell us the orientation of the concatenomers. So you have this asymmetric cut as echo R1, and so if the concatenomer is head to tail, you get a unit length molecule. If they are head to head, you get a larger fragment, 5800, and if they're tail to tail, you get a smaller fragment of 2900. Okay. So here is the southern blot, and this is actually a monomer circle. I'll prove that to you in a minute. This is a supercoiled circle. These are relaxed dimers or supercoiled concatomers. These are relaxed concatomers or linear concatomers. And then this stuff stuck up in the well could be integrated molecules. And then when we digest with the different cutters, so undigested, one, zero cut, one cut to give us the polarity, and two cut, two cut gives you the total copy number of vector in, in the cells. Uh, uncut and zero cut, by I mean zero cut, it does not cut the vector. It's obviously cutting genomic DNA. Uh, we get these, these bands and then the one cut, echo R1, gives us the polarity, and you can see head to head, head to tail, uh, some linear fragment, okay? But there's no tail to tail species. What we wanted to, sh to look at here is really these supercoiled monomer circles and the relaxed monomer circles. Relaxed dimer circles, supercoiled concatomers, concatomers. Okay, and so what we're doing 
is digesting the genomic DNA with a variety of zero cutters. So it's cutting the genomic DNA to uh, various extents. So the average size here goes from 4 kb up to 8 kb of the human genome digest or the primate genome digested. And what you can see is compared to uncut, we're releasing the copy numbers out that are trapped. So essentially the the DNA here, the vector is not integrated into the chromatin. I'll show you even more convincing data, but uh, at first pass we're releasing these episomes that are being trapped by genomic in the well uh, out and they're then migrating to these different positions. Okay, so we're seeing this trapping. Okay, so to convince you that those are episomal and there's very little integrated DNA, we did the following experiment. So this is a southern blot. Here we're probing with the WPRE sequence in the vector. Here we're probing with the, uh, an endogenous gene that's in the genomic DNA, not in the vector and this is a thidium. So the first lane, there is no treatment. So XBA is a zero cutter, meaning it doesn't cut the vector. If we treat the DNA with PSDNAs, plasmid-safe DNAs, it's an exonuclease, it's ATP dependent, it digests all forms of DNA except circular double-stranded DNA. So it'll digest all the single-stranded vector DNA, it will digest genomic DNA, it will digest linear DNA. Um, and so what you see is that when we probe this blot, we, that supercoiled monomer and the relaxed monomer and these concatomers are resistant to PSDNAs. Then we hit it again with PSDNAs for another eight hours and again, the signal remains. If we treat with XBA, our no-cutter, you see these molecules that are trapped up here. Some of it gets released compared to the uncut. And then if we combine the XBA1, so if you think about it, XBA1 is going to start digesting the genomic DNA every 4 kb. And then PSDNAs is going to be even more efficient at digesting the genomic. So we treat with XBA plus PS or XBA plus two PSs and all of this signal is, is getting depleted yet the monomer supercoiled circle, monomer relaxed circle and the concatomers remain. And to prove that we're digesting the genomic DNA, if we strip that blot and probe now with EPO, an endogenous gene, there's no signal here. So we've completely eliminated the genomic DNA, and yet the AAV signal is here. This is the ethidium stain gel, and all the genomic DNA is gone. Okay. So in primate muscle, at 20 months, the vector, predominant vector signals are episomal circles, concatomeric, monomer, uh, that are persisting. So monomers are circular, concatomers are circular, and the genome is existing as episomes. To put a nail in the coffin that um, the vector was not integrating, we did LAM-PCR. Here if we have an integration event, we PCR out using a biotin labeled primer to RSV. You do this linear amplification, you capture that product on a magnetic uh, streptavidin bead. You synthesize the second strand by random priming. Do an endonuclease digestion with a rare cutter, TSP. Add a linker, which brings in a new primer location. Then you do the PCR to get this product for southern blot. And if you have a product, you clone it and sequence it. So looking at all of 
the amplifications, we get no, no AV cellular junctions and pyro sequencing of a, with 150,000 reads, there's no junctions. Okay, so by the PSDNA analysis and by LAM PCR, um, we are seeing no integration, no integration in primate muscle. So the question was, um, so that data with PSDNAs was actually shown in mice previously out of uh, Reed Clark's lab at Ohio. And um, uh, so up until now, we haven't shown anything necessarily novel except we did it in primates. The question was, are these episomes in a chromatin structure? Okay. So there's precedence that circular viral genomes are chromatinized, so SV40 and other polyomaviruses, gamma herpes viruses, uh, hepatitis viruses, and then um, MVM and wild type AV, there was some very early publications showing that those genomes were associated with histones, but um, uh, whether those vectors were actually integrated or not and chromatinized uh, was not really evaluated. So when we analyze the muscle on the right side of the scheme that I showed you where we're isolating the nuclei, treating with mycococcal nuclease, the reason we're doing that is because chromatin uh, can be digested with mycococcal nuclease to give a banding pattern. So you do a partial digestion with mycococcal nuclease. If the DNA is chromatinized, the nucleosomes protect the DNA against mycococcal nuclease, you get digestion uh, in the linker regions of the chromatin. And if you do a partial digestion, you get a ladder from a monomer nucleosome, you know, upward. Okay. So here is an ethidium gel, <laughs> the control macaque, and then a macaque that was transduced with AV. If you isolate the nuclei, treat with mycococcal, isolate the DNA and run it on the southern blot, this is what the ethidium gel looks like. You get this banding pattern. Okay? If you probe that gel with an AV specific probe, the WPRE, you get no signal in the control animal and you get this ladder of the vector uh, DNA. And then if you strip that again and you probe with EPO, an endogenous gene, you can light up the banding pattern in both. This is the genomic DNA signal and what you can hopefully see is that the banding pattern here is essentially the same as cellular chromatin. I showed you in the first few slides that the gene expression is maintained. So even though these genomes are being chromatinized, they're not being um, shut down, okay? There are instances where viral genomes as a cellular defense response, that those viral genomes get chromatinized and gene expression is suppressed. But for AV, that gene expression is on and stays on for six years or so. Okay. So the genomes associated with histones, uh, this is at 22 months post-injection. The genome is episomal. So the conclusion is that those episomal circles are chromatinized. Um, here, we're not just looking at the WPRE, which is at uh, the three prime end of the genome, but we're also looking at the RSV promoter just to see if there were any differences along the genome. The control MAC, there's no signals in either side. Um, and then these are three MACs that you can see the banding pattern uh, here with the WPRE and then also with the RSV promoter. 
Okay, you can see these shadows. So um, you're seeing nucleosomes not just on the WPRE region, but also on the promoter region. So the conclusions are that two years after administration to skeletal muscle of the primates, um, that the main forms are present as monomers and high molecular weight concatomers, that they're circular, that they're supercoiled. Um, the major forms that persist are episomal, that those episomes are organized into a chromatin structure, and that there's really no inhibition of gene expression from the vector. So we actually treated with this HDAC inhibitor to see if we could even increase gene expression just in, in the event that a subset of those molecules was suppressed by chromatinization and we could not get uh, the gene expression to increase. Okay. And the last point is that it's independent of the serotype and the copy number. So once those concatomers are established, um, it does not appear that, that, the, that the dose that's given to the animals necessarily influences the number of genome uh, copies in the concatomer. Okay. So Magali was the first author on this paper that was published at the end of 2008. She's in Philippe's lab. Um, Jan Shirel and uh, Jacques Yves uh, at the vet school in Nantes. And then at Heidelberg, uh, Christoph von Kahle's group did the LAM PCR. Are there any questions on this part of the talk? Okay. I, I, I yeah. Did I understand correctly from the southern blotting that the vast majority of genomes are monomeric and not multimerized? Yeah. There may be a technical uh, explanation to that. Um, when you do the southerns, the transfer of high molecular weight isn't as efficient as the low molecular weight. But uh, to address that, we were doing depurination of the gels to break up the large uh, concatomers before transfer. So we don't know if there's still a gradient of transfer, but um, we tried to address that so as best we could. the default is a single monomer that circularizes? Yes. We talked about a different mechanism yesterday, but yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, switching gears to a different um, evaluation of persistence. We're looking at uh, the status of the AV vector genome in PBMCs transduced collaterally in vivo. So this project is funded by the World Anti-Doping Agency. So what we're trying to do is come up with methods to detect AV um, transduction in athletes, illicit AAV transduction in athletes who want to pursue performance enhancing uh, gene transfer. And so we're having to use non-invasive techniques because no athlete is going to subject themselves to a muscle biopsy. Um, and also if you were going to perform a muscle biopsy you wouldn't even know where to begin. You know, is it in the calf muscle, the quads, the deltoids, wherever, um, if, if those vectors are being utilized illicitly, uh, you, you don't know where to sample. So we chose to look at blood uh, because athletes have to actually submit blood samples before they compete. And we're comparing naked DNA injection. Here we, we created this plasmid. It's EPO. Uh, it's, it's homologous, it's um, macaque EPO under the control of a human PGK promoter. The point here was that we wanted to inject a lot of this plasmid but not increase the hematocrit too much um, just to see if we could actually detect plasmid in PBMCs. 
And then here, this is the AAV vector plasmid. Again, it's the CM EPO under the control of a strong promoter. And the purpose here is to inject very low doses of AAV to get a slight rise in hematocrit and be able to see if we can actually detect the vector in uh, PBMC. So in both cases, we only want the hematocrit to come up a little bit above normal. Otherwise, the athletes would be um, uh, identified just having a too high a hematocrit, right? We wouldn't need to develop fancy assays for, for the vectors. So we developed four assays. One targets the canamycin gene and the backbone of the plasmid. The SV40 poly A is in common with both vectors uh, here. And then we developed an assay for the transgene itself to distinguish it from the endogenous genomic. And we have developed an assay for epsilon globin, which is an endogenous gene, which we use to normalize the input samples. Okay, so the macaque EPO gene contains four exons. And to distinguish the cDNA from the genomic DNA, we developed this TACMAN assay where the primers are in the exon, and then we have this probe over the exon-exon junction. And the performance of those assays, you can see we tested these in the absence and the presence of 500 nanograms of genomic DNA. The linearity, the R squareds here are, are uh, pretty good. You can see that there's some difference in the presence of genomic DNA, uh, not a lot. Uh, here, there's no competition between the sequences in the vector and the genomic DNA. Same for the canamycin, but for the exon-exon, these primers are not only binding the cDNA, but they're also going to bind the genomic DNA, so that there is some competition. The efficiency of the reactions uh, is shown here. Again, we get some difference here with the exon assay, not a whole lot with SV40 or canamycin. So linearity is maintained over eight logs. Um, the genomic DNA doesn't significantly interfere um, with the assays. The uh, even though I'm not showing it to you, the sensitivity of the assays are three copies. So we input a half a microgram of DNA. That represents <coughs> around 150,000 haploid copies of the genome. Uh, and we can detect three copies. It's not a nested PCR assay, it's a direct assay. We make the vector, we inject uh, our primates, isolate blood, purify the DNA, and then subject them to real-time PCR. So we validated um, the blood collection there were some nuances about optimizing uh, the blood collection to preserve the integrity of the DNA. We optimized the DNA isolation procedure and actually validated. So the first part of the talk I just showed you, AV is persisting as an episome. So we don't know in PBMCs whether AV is integrated or whether it persists as an episome. So in our validation of the DNA isolation procedure, we actually did experiments. We were spiking genomic DNA with small plasmids and large plasmids to replicate concatenators to make sure that we could actually isolate these different forms of the AV vector and then uh, develop those assays. So MAC1 and 2 are injected with plasmid, naked plasmid DNA, 10 milligrams, one injection. So that's a lot of DNA. Uh, and then MAX 3 through 6, uh, 3 and 4 got AV1, 5 and 6 got AV8, and MAX 3 and MAX 6 actually got the same dose of two different vectors. And this is the vector, um, again, CMV promoter driving uh, the EPO. And here, 
just to iterate, it's a low dose of AV vector with a strong promoter, and it's a high dose of plasmid vector with a weak promoter. And I'm, I'm not going to show you the, the, um, the hematocrits or, or EPO levels, but we got them to rise uh, about 5-10% above uh, baseline. Anyway, uh, the, plasmid he oh, the plasmid is here. It's analyzed by all three assays, the Exxon, um, EPO assay, the SV40 and the canamycin. So remember, SV40 and canamycin, there's no competition with, with the genomic DNA. And you can see that um, uh, at 30 minutes post injection, we can see DNA associated with white blood cells. I don't think it's actually in the white blood cells. I think that's probably carryover from serum. Uh, we peak at day one, and then it's pretty much gone by 30 days associated with the cells. That's MAC1. MAC2 is, uh, confirms the same, same data. Okay. If we look at the serum, um, you know, the scale here, this is a million copies at the peak. Here's serum. This is 10 million copies. So about 10% is carrying over into the white blood cells. Um, in the serum, the signal's gone at about 30 days, okay? So the plasmid in, in whole blood can be detected by all three assays. The maximum copy number occurs at day one, and it falls back to a baseline within about uh, uh, 30 days. Not, not one week, but about 30 days. On the other hand, AAV persists. Okay, so this is AAV. This is DNA isolated from uh, the white blood cell fraction. Uh, Max 3 and 4 got AAV1. 5 and 6 got AAV8. And 3 and 6 got the same dose. And we're detecting here out to 28 weeks uh, in this animal, 17 weeks, 57 weeks, and 28 weeks. Uh, AAV vector sequences. So I think like plasmid, um, the vector is just in the serum. It's just in the circulation here at 30 minutes post injection one day, but then it falls off and then you get some cell type that is that maintains the AAV sequences over uh, several months. And if we look at serum, the signal is gone in five weeks. So the point is that if you inject plasmid DNA, this is the profile you see uh, with plasmid DNA, okay? Not only in serum, but also in the white blood cell fraction. Whereas AV, it falls off in the serum shown here, but it persists in the white blood cell for many months more. Uh, looking at urine, you know, it's, it's uh, processed by the kidneys and, and uh, eliminated uh, within five weeks. So the vectors maintain in white blood cells, but not serum for long term. We're detecting about five copies in a half a microgram of DNA, um, which probably indicates that the vectors maintain in a subset of, of, of some small population of the white blood cell fraction. And if you compare MAC3 to MAC6, AV1 is more efficient to enter the circulation uh, following an IM injection than AV8. Okay? Any questions on that portion? Okay. Um, the folks doing this work, my graduate student Wei Yi, uh, Jennifer and Sammy, and then in Nantes, um, Carolyn Legagne. Magali is, is working here on this project as, uh, in Philippe Moulier's lab. And it's funded by World Anti-Doping Agency, the United States Anti-Doping Agency, and the French Anti-Doping Agency. No. 
But what we are going to do is actually, as we speak, monkeys are being uh, transduced. I am again, and we're going to do cell sorting to see what cell fraction the AV vector could be in. Okay, see if we can't enrich in one of those populations. Okay, so I'm going to kind of switch topics here and, and talk now about AV production and AV testing and lot release. Um, Mauro and I have had a lot of discussions about trying to bring an AV vector to the clinic, and so um, I included some slides on that. So before, I want to do just a little bit of hybrid basic biology, applied biology, and this started as a project a few years ago. The capsid of AV uh, is encoded by two mRNA species from, driven by the P40 promoter. So this is the genome representation. VP1 comes off of this message that is a rare message. There's a splice here. This is actually the rare alternate splice that creates this message. The predominant message encodes VP2 and 3. VP2 has a a rare start codon, an ACG instead of an ATG. So the ribosome comes across and skips that and goes to this ATG on the, on the predominant message. So you get a ratio of VP3 of 10 parts to one part to one part. So in the, the entire capsid, you have 50 parts of VP3, five parts, and five parts. And the way that's controlled is this is a, this is a um, rare message, and then this is a rare translational start. Okay, VP3 has everything going for it. So right now, there's 11 serotypes over 100 genetic variants. Um, and we published this, I don't know, four years ago. Um, if you take uh, AV virus, vector virions, and you run them on, on a western blot, and after you treat them or don't treat them with trypsin, you get the following banding pattern. So if you take the, DN the virus and just run it, you have VP1, 2, and 3, you have some, some fragments here. If you digest that uh, DNA, uh, sorry, virus with trypsin, you get conversion of VP1 to this band, VP2 gets converted to that band right there, and VP3 gets converted to that band. And what's happening is we're cutting off the C terminus of the capsid proteins with trypsin. This is a polyclonal antibody, so you're seeing all the fragments. The B1 antibody only recognizes the extreme C terminus, so you see this fragment here. Uh, as this gets converted, as that N gets clipped off, you don't see it by B1, and it all ends up here. A69 is an antibody that recognizing the, the N terminus, and then A1 only specifically recognizes VP1. So if we look at full versus empty capsids, there's one signature that sticks out, and that's this band right here. So a full capsid digested with trypsin will give you that band, and an empty capsid treated with trypsin will not. So we have a signature of full and empty, uh, which is, was uh, fairly unique. We map that digestion site. It's right here. It's near the heparin binding site. So trypsin uh, digests basic amino acid residues, uh, lysines or arginines. And so you get this fragment, this terminal fragment that is migrating here. If you then go and say, well, what do the other banding patterns for different serotypes look like? Uh, this is this is the uh, data. 
If you treat with trypsin, this is the data I just showed you. Um, as you do this time course, uh, you get the conversion of VP1, 2, and 3 to these different bands. AAV5 is, is fairly resistant to um, trypsin digestion, as is AAV1. Chymotrypsin, on the other hand, you can start to see different fragments with AAV1, a different set of fragments with AAV2. Again, these are different uh, antibodies, and then AAV5 is resistant. So the point of this is we're trying to establish a database where we know which serotypes are susceptible to which proteases, and then also the signatures of each of those proteases for each serotype. To develop quality control assays for clinical vector product release. So right now, identity testing is required by law so that you know that you're actually administering the vector that you think you are to the patients. And identity testing has really concentrated just on the, the genome of the vector. So if you're expressing um, VEGF, you would actually isolate the viral DNA from your GMP prep and sequence it and show that it's, it's the right thing. But there, there are no tests to say that you've got it in the right capsid. So if you're doing AV1 VEGF, there's no assay to say, yeah, that's the right capsid. You didn't screw up. It's not AV2 or, or some other serotype. The other thing that was unexpected was proteinase K, which I think most people use to isolate the genomic DNA from virions to titer. Um, proteinase K has a huge variation on its ability to digest the capsid. So here, AAV2 with 0.1 micrograms in the digest over two hours um, really uh, can digest the capsid quite efficiently, whereas AAV4 is not even touched. So if you go and you titer an AAV2 versus an AAV4 and you're treating those virions with proteinase, you're using that same protocol for every serotype, um, the message I'm trying to tell you today is don't just assume that that uh, is, is a protocol that works for every serotype. And then here is the profile. Um, using the B1 antibody. This is slightly different here. We're doing a titration of the enzyme. AAV2 uh, gets fully digested by the time you're out at 10 micrograms uh, for an hour. AAV1, um, also AAV5 remains fairly intact. AAV8 gets shredded. So um, we we're actually have a, a manuscript in preparation where we've gone and we've looked at um, this really uh, at a high level at, at the liberation of the genome from the different serotypes when you treat with proteinase K. So there are different susceptibilities of the serotypes to proteases. There are different patterns. Uh, we can differentiate full from empty particles. Uh, and then uh, just last year we published a follow-on paper to this where we described a uh, mass spec uh, method to do serotype identification. Uh, Kim Van Vliet on the proteidase paper and the mass spec paper, uh, and then uh, authors from the lab were also involved. So, um, that I run in Florida is really a state resource for biopharmaceutical product development. And it's called, it's got this really long name. Uh, within the center, we have a manufacturing group, we have an education center, and we have uh, research activities. So. The manufacturing is a 100% dedicated operation. Every person there is 100% FTE, a full-time employee who 
only develops and manufactures products for the clinic. Um, there are no students that work here. They're all professionals. Most of them I hired from industry. But early on, I, I wanted to capture all that knowledge from all those people. There's about 40 people that work there. I wanted to capture that knowledge into education programs that we have disseminated throughout the state of Florida, from the high school level all the way through uh, masters and uh, some courses at the PhD level. All of the curriculum is centered around product development, regulatory compliance, analytical development, process development, a lot of the things I talked about this morning. And then the research activity is really centered on process science and analytical science. So we do things like design processes, develop them, do mammalian cell engineering, do upstream, downstream design, do b banking, make bulk drug substance, we fill and finish uh, things into vials, and then we have our own in-house quality control and quality assurance activities. This is a new addition. This is a thousand liter mixer. We're actually making uh, solutions that go into IV bags. So we fill 1,000 one liter IV bags uh, for one of our products. Uh, since we opened in, at the end of October of 2006, we've released over 35 product lots. Uh, that cover everything from anti-HIV therapy through cardiovascular therapies. And 95% of our clients are companies. There's about 5% that make up government and academic contracts. So the amazing thing is, is, is these clients, they, they find out about us, they want to come and do an audit, they have very low expectations because we're in an academic setting and academic operations usually don't meet the requirements and standards of industry. And then uh, 17 audits that we've had by private companies, some of them Fortune 500 companies, so very large pharmaceutical companies, 100% of them have signed contracts with us after they see our quality systems, meet our staff, see our facility, and understand our capabilities. So this is our facility. Um, the auditorium here is probably about the size of these three rooms put together. So this is all manufacturing. This is warehouse. These are all of the clean rooms. We have six manufacturing suites. One, two, three, four, five, and then a sixth over here. Quality control labs, office space, and so we can run six projects and products concurrently. One of those products is a vector for um, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase deficiency. This is one of the enzymes in the dopamine synthesis pathway. Uh, you would find um, uh, this is a, an extremely rare disease that manifests itself in the first year of life. Um, the infants have severe developmental delay, uh, hypotonia, they're lethargic, um, and then they have various uh, uh, you know, uh, phenotypes, uh, irritability, muscle spasms, and, and uncontrolled movement. So um, we manufactured this vector. This is the process that we use. It's a 10 cell factory process. So each cell factory is 10 layers. Each cell factory contains around 10 to the 9th cells. So 10 of those is 10 to the 10th cells. We thaw a vial of cells. We expand them uh, to 10 cell factories. We transfect them. We harvest. So at the harvest, that's actually a harvesting of the cells. There's a subset of testing that happens. Then we purify the vector. That's called the purified bulk. Uh, if you were at my talk this morning, that is the drug substance. Then that gets some testing, and then <coughs> we, <coughs> we mix various sublots together 
So if we had like a muscle protocol, we would do 10 lots of 10 and then mix them, filter it, fill it, uh, and then uh, put that in the vials and then the final product is tested. And that constitutes a, a batch, a lot release. So going into this a little bit in more detail, that requires us to make E. coli master cell banks. So we have the helper plasmid, which contains the rep AV, the AV genes, rep and cap. The vector plasmid, you know, in this case it would be VEGF. So you make those constructs, you sequence them, uh, you make E. coli master cell banks, which then get tested for phage contamination and uh, all sorts of other tests. We make the transfection reagents. All of the, all the, all that gets made in house. It gets quality controlled, um, pH, osmolality. We actually do tests to make sure that we're transfecting the cells that, that they're actually performing before we release those into GMP manufacturing. We've made our 293 master cell bank. A master cell bank costs about $100,000 to make because you have to do an incredible number of tests. You have to test for all the viral adventitious agents, HIV, CMV, HSV, HTLV1. The list goes on and on. You have to show it's sterile. You have to do isoenzyme testing to show that the cell is the right species, um, mycoplasma testing, et cetera. And then you make a working cell bank that gets another subset of tests. Uh, we buy DMAM and FBS. Uh, we've moved away from trypsin. We're using now a recombinant product called triple LE. And then uh, PBS. So to transfect, uh, you're doing uh, 10 cell factories. That's actually 10 to the 10th cells, not 5 times 10 to the 9. You use 18 milligrams of helper plasmid, 6 milligrams of vector plasmid. You mix that together with HBS and calcium chloride, transfect that, and then three days later you harvest the cells. You have to get those cells off of plastic. We use EDTA and then uh, spin those out and then take samples for testing. So mycoplasma testing happens at this point. Adventitious agent testing happens. And then that harvest gets frozen. And then for this specific trial uh, for AADC deficiency, they wanted us to separate full capsids from empty capsids. And we did that on an iodexinal gradient. So you f open the cells up by freezing and thawing. You treat them with benzenase, which is an enzyme that destroys all RNA, DNA, anything that's not packaged. Separate the lysate on an iodexinal gradient purify it on an ion exchange gradient, sulfopropyl, and then formulate that. And this supported a 10-patient trial, four injections of 40 microliters each um, at uh, about uh, one and a half times 10 to the 11th uh, dose. Um, before establishing the center of excellence at the, at the gene therapy center when I was uh, directing the GMP core there. Uh, we created a, a vector for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, this was for a phase 1-2 clinical trial. And uh, Terry Flott was the PI. It was a four-point IM injection deltoid, a dose escalation up to seven times 10 to the 13 vector genomes. There were three adults per cohort. And we manufactured that in one batch around three times ten to the 14, plus the testing and stability samples, which was really around 10 to the 15 vector genomes that we manufactured. And then those results were, were published, and uh, essentially it had a very good safety profile. We also, for alpha-1 antitrypsin, we packaged the same vector in an AV1 serotype and manufactured that for a clinical trial that was also published in PNAS um, about two years ago. We manufactured a vector for Lieber congenital amaurosis. This is inherited blindness. Um, this was the PI here was uh, Sam Jacobson at, at Penn, a subretinal injection of six times 10 to the vector genomes, three adults per cohort. 
we manufactured that in one batch around three times from the 14. Uh, and then that was published in 2008 with no toxicity, no T cell responses, and then an increase, uh, a self-reported increase in visual sensitivity. For these tri this trial and this trial, um, we, instead of using an iodexinal gradient, we actually manufactured it using an all chromatography process, um, oh, sorry, which was uh, scalable, closed, automated, um, resulted in high vector concentration, a good particle to infectious ratio. Uh, everything was qualified or, and uh, clean in place procedures, how you actually clean those columns. All of that was validated. This is the process. Instead of using freeze and thaw to open up the cells, we actually use a microfluidizer. This is a machine that forces the cells through a very narrow pore. And when the pressure differential across that pore, the cell explodes as it comes out the nozzle. So we microfluidize. We treat with benzenase, again, to get rid of the genomic DNA. Affinity purification on heparin uh, agarose. A hydrophobic step with phenylsephorus, ion exchange with sulfopropyl uh, 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 sephorus. Our purified bulk uh, was, is then tested, it's formulated, put into the vial, and then tested again. And these are the chromatograms. Essentially, when you lyse the cells by microfluidization, you're releasing every cell component out of the cell, every protein. So when you load, this is your load. This is the A280, and this is the peak you get that's AAV. After you elute, that peak is then put on phenylsephorus, which it actually flows through the phenylsephorus. And then we capture it on ion exchange, and you get this pure peak of AAV. The QC testing is, is very extensive. Uh, you do infectious titer. Um, we quantify the genome titer, the vector genome titer, by real-time PCR. And then we do a capsid ELISA to look at total capsids. So the capsid ELISA tells you the total number of full and empty capsids. The real-time PCR tells you how many are full. And the infectious titer tells you of all of those uh, full particles, how many are infectious. The potency test is a transgene, so we would run a infect cells in vitro with the VEGF vector. We would measure VEGF either by ELISA or Western, uh, some kind of test that says that we're expressing the protein. Purity uh, for other protein uh, impurities replication competent AAV, so a recombination between the helper plasmid and the vector plasmid would generate wild type AAV. The regulatory agencies need to know how much is present. 293 chromosomal DNA, even though we get rid of most of it with benzenase, um, there's still a requirement. The World Health Organization has set a limit of uh, 10 nanograms per dose a vector. Uh, so at your highest dose, you can't have more than, than 10 nanograms of cellular DNA in, in the product. And then we have to check that we've removed the benzenase. If we've added it to the reaction, we have to show by ELISA that we've removed uh, the enzyme. Then there's identity testing. So you sequence the plasmid. When you make the E. coli master bank, there's some identity testing. But then also, uh, at least in the United States, you're required to isolate genomic DNA from the viral vector, the clinical lot, and sequence it directly. Uh, there's visual inspections. You can't have particles in there, I mean, uh, visible particles. So uh, uh, appearance test is you take a vial and you put it against a white background and you look for dark particles and you put it against a black background and you're looking for white particles. 
pH, osmolality, these are mainly tests to show that you formulated into the buffer that you expect, whether it's PBS or some other formula. Then there's safety testing, adventitious viral agents, I, I kind of ran through a list of those, sterility, mycoplasma, endotoxin, and then you have to do stability studies. So uh, concurrent with the clinical trial or concurrent with the animal toxicology trial, you have to show that your agent is still potent. So infectious titer and sterility testing to show that the vial that the vector's in has maintained its integrity, that uh, the seal on your cryovial isn't degrading or something like that and making the product uh, not sterile. Okay, this is kind of the same list. Everything designated with FB are assays that we've developed and qualified and support uh, for our uh, GMP studies. Um, and then a lot of these we outsource. Again, things like sterility, mycoplasma, and endotoxin, which are safety tests. We want a third party to be testing those so there's no conflict of interest. These are the specs. So sterility, there's no growth. Endotoxin has to be less than 50 endotoxin units per mil. Infectious titer, vector genome titers. In some cases, you may not be able to set a specification. It's okay to actually have a specification where you're, where you're going to just report the result. So you qualify the assay, you get a, a number, but you just report the number without actually having a specification that you have to meet. Purity for a phase one trial, you start low. You say it's not greater than 90% purity. As you march through phase two and phase three, that purity spec gets narrower and narrower, 95%, 99% as you get more towards a commercial product. Um, as I said, 100, it's actually uh, 10 nanograms per dose. Uh, benzenase and then recombinant AAV. Purity, this is a, an SDS page gel uh, showing purity. And then for stability, you know, we've done short term and long term stability in cryo tubes and in glass vials. The, um, the reason we do short term at room temperature, this is the temperature where we actually have to fill the vector. So if we have the bulk product, it takes a few hours to actually get it into the vials and get it frozen. So you need to show that the vector is, is stable. This drop, so th these studies were conducted at a very low vector concentration. Two times 10 to the 11 is a low concentration. So what we're seeing here in these drops is likely due to absorption to the surface rather than inactivation of the particles. Okay, so this is the center, um, and I, it's my pleasure to be able to tell their story. So thank you very much.